Rob Hill is a businessman, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He's based in Quincy, Massachusetts, which is about 10 miles south of Boston. And he is the founder and CEO of Granite Telecommunications. Granite is a telecommunications wholesaler that sells exclusively to large businesses and government organizations. So what that means is Granite does not manufacture or own any of the cable or wireless equipment that its clients use to access their phone systems. Rather, Granite buys or leases that stuff from large phone companies like AT&T, Verizon, and cable companies like Comcast and Charter, and then it flips it to customers at a markup, uh, but not before installing its own software, which enables Granite to become its clients' outsourced IT departments. So Granite customer service team oversees all the network operations for its clients' phone systems. While most corporations have moved their phone systems onto the internet, many still rely on landlines or POTS lines, short for plain old telephone service, to power their critical services in stores. These are fire alarms, security systems, and elevator lines that need redundancy. What interested me about Hale's story is how somebody could build a 21st century fortune on the back of a 150 year old technology. Granite pioneered the wholesaling business for analog phone lines. These are the twisted copper wires that have their origins in the 19th century when Alexander Graham Bell patented uh, the telephone system. There's still a need to manage those POTS lines. And what Hale did was he innovated off of that legacy technology and found value in it where others did not. The lessons that I learned coming out of a, you know, a private company that went public were understand your strengths and your weaknesses and control your own destiny. So Granite doesn't have any debt. We're 20 years old now. We're, we're about at $1.8 billion in revenue. We don't have any debt. We don't have any outside investors. So we control our own financial destiny. Building a network is complex and expensive, especially 20 years ago. It's gotten, because of technology, it's gotten dramatically less expensive. But building and running a network is a, is a, is a skill set that we needed to grow over time. We probably didn't have it at that time. What we've always had is a skill set for getting and keeping customers. We're, we're great on the customer relationship side of this business. Hale founded a company called Network Plus in 1990 when he was 23 years old. He had had two telecom sales gigs and he saw an opening in the market. Uh, which was providing small business customers with long distance telephone service. The first eight or so years of this business were solid for Hale. Uh, they netted margins around 10, 11 percent. Uh, they didn't carry any debt. Things were going well. So after legislation in 1996 opened up the local phone market to competition, investors started throwing money at telecom companies that were laying down cable and were building physical networks. So Hale moved his business from the wholesaling model and into the network building model. And so that required a lot of capital. So uh, Network Plus took on over $200 million in debt. We went public in June of 99. And we were those sexy stocks that uh, there was so much demand that the stock opened at a level much higher than the original trade was proposed. So we were supposed to open trading at 16. In fact, the first trade opened at 26. Over the next nine months, the stock went all the way up to 63. I own 27 million shares, so I had a billion four next to my name. But then after the dot-com crash, things all came crashing down. Network Plus hadn't had the time to actually build that network. So it was left hanging essentially. And the company declared bankruptcy in February of 2002, sold its remaining assets for less than $16 million, just a few years after reaching a valuation of 3.4 billion by investors. And Hill was forced to lay off hundreds of employees. You know, I had the, the local news, newspaper, when we were high on the hog, used to list me on the front page as the boy billionaire. And then when we were bankrupt, they used to list, or going into bankruptcy, 
they listed me as the busted boy billionaire. And, and those, you know, those are things you never forget. I needed to reclaim my dignity. I needed it. Like, I, I'm telling you, like, I need oxygen. I needed that. So I was eager to rebuild quickly. And there, honestly, there was never a thought in my mind that we wouldn't. I knew uh, February 4th of 2002, and I, in my soul, I worked as hard as I could to make sure that Network Plus survived as best possible and as many people as possible kept their jobs. But on February 5th of 2002, I was full steam ahead. We're going to start a new business, and we're, and we're going to win this time. I remember, like it was yesterday, we were closing the books on October of the second year. And we, had, the controller called me, and it was like seven o'clock at night, and I was walking across the street, and we had made about a $565,000 profit for that month, which was up a couple of hundred. Um, and I remember thinking, like almost weeping, we made it, like this is gonna work. So Hale has personally given, along with his wife, Karen, who's closely involved in their philanthropic decision making, over $280 million to various hospitals, universities, schools, and smaller community-based organizations. This year, he and Karen are doing something different. They're giving $1 million per week to a new small community-based charity to help these groups set up endowments, which they can draw down upon for years to come. Uh, the idea is to help give these charities a more sustainable financial future. And part of Hale's story with philanthropy too is that Granite is one of the most philanthropic corporations in America. It's given $225 million to various charities over its two decade existence. and. Philanthropy is core to Hale's persona, but also to Granite's brand. It's helped make the company known locally as well as nationally for uh, the good works that it does. Karen and I uh, subscribe to the philosophy Maya Angelou articulated to whom much is given, much is expected. We have had great fortune. And I'm certain none of that good fortune None of those good tidings would have befallen us if it weren't for our community. So first of all, it seems very logical to me that the community gave us these opportunities. We should try to reward, bring our rewards back to the community. Boston's renowned for a lot of things, but at front and center is education and healthcare. And so Karen and I feel like a gift to Boston healthcare is actually like a triple dip it's a one gift affects three different constituents. First, if we give money to an institution like Dana Farber or Children's Hospital or Brigham Women's Hospital, which are all great institutions that we are honored to support, it's gonna help our community because it makes that hospital in our community better. So the care they're gonna to provide to our community is lifted. But secondly, these are number one, number three, and number nine ranked hospitals in the world at their skill sets. The medicine that's going to come, the research that's going to come from these institutions is going to change the world. And so the cure to cancer, for in, in particular, we focus on pancreatic cancer. I believe it's going to be found in Dana-Farber. And, and some of the medicines and, and the early indicating research that they're developing will affect the world. So it's a gift to impact the world. And then finally, we're a Boston family. We want Boston to flourish. And what Boston is best at, among a few other things, is medicine. So if we can make our medical institutions even better, then Boston gets better. So when we give to, to healthcare in Boston, it feels like we're getting extra reward for each single gift.